After two weeks test driving the 2021 Kia Carnival during Sydney's recent biblical floods, you know, whipping down to Bunnings and getting the lumber for my ark and collecting all of the animals in pairs, ideal vehicle for that incidentally, and sundry other Noah-esque assignments of that nature, here is everything I loved about that car and everything I hated. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. Website for that, obviously. Or you can just click the car that's up there now, dude. My fortnight in Kia Carnival was split equally between the V6 petrol platinum and the 2.2 turbo diesel platinum. Kia supplied both vehicles in the same way. Evaluation vehicles are typically supplied to other media outlets for reviews of this nature. The vehicles get picked up by me, fully detailed and in a pristine state, full of fuel, and I do my level best to return them filthy, empty and slightly the worse for wear. <laughs> As required by the motoring journalist's code of ethics, hashtag respect. But... I mostly stop short of keeping chooks or feral cats in them for my time with those vehicles or my collection of wet straw. I don't do that either. That would be somewhat disrespectful in my view, even for me. The point is that Kia does not get a say in whatever I say in this report. They don't see the report before it goes live and, you know, they can give me feedback if they want and I cannot give a shit about that if I want, and generally I do want that. So that's quite an equitable arrangement when you think about it. And it's good for you too, because they don't get to nudge me around on the chessboard. My default position on Carnival is, I tried my level best to detest that vehicle overall because it's a people mover, <laughs> mainly. And I always fail to hate it, I always do. I end up loving the damn thing, especially the diesel, and we'll get to that. I look forward to driving a carnival every time and I hate giving it back, go figure. Despite my sincere efforts to the contrary. In the context of what this vehicle purports to be and what it purports to be good at doing, it is a very faithful execution indeed. Carnival's not perfect, of course, no car is. So the purpose for me bringing you the hate as well as the love is A, hate balances out love and I do want this report to be somewhat balanced and B, it alerts you to the things you might not ultimately like about the vehicle which might matter to you a whole lot more than they did to me. And this of course is very important for you to know before you go out and drop the big bucks. Carnival is objectively better than an SUV in so many important ways like accommodation and access, and luggage space, versatility and convenience. And frankly, I think a great many people who buy a typical seven-seat SUV would actually be objectively better off in a carnival. There's a lot more to love than to hate about this vehicle, and none of the hate items would be a deal-breaker for me. It's just like any relationship, basically, except possibly your relationship with your dominatrix. You've got to embrace the things you love and learn to live with the things you hate. And this goes for every relationship, from that with your lovely wife, to your job, and even, I guess, your smartphone. And of course, with your dominatrix, love and hate are exactly the same thing, dude. There is no spoon. Love number one. If a car maker is going to rip off another car maker's styling, okay, it might as well be from an enduring icon, in this case, seemingly the mighty Range Rover. Prestige pants pooping icon from way back. Note the carnival's bonnet, that's a hood in America, which wraps down over the mudguards, right? And the blacked out pillars, which make the roof appear to float, at least visually. Rangies have been doing that quite successfully, I might add, ever since Joanna Lumley starred in the New Avengers back in 1976. I was 12 years old back then, and I must say she had quite a profound effect on me. And she is still quite hot, I note. Back to the car now. The gloss black wheels on the Platinum, 
It's all a bit gangster. The two sliding doors too, so popular with the drive-by shooting set and of course, families. And the grill on the Platinum plus the other metal highlights dribbled around the car, very swish indeed. And in fact, maybe a bit too swish. Which brings me to hate number one. Because Platinum's overall swish-ishness, if that's a word, makes lesser SLI and SL variants look quite poverty by comparison, in my view. You know, if you put them side by side. And they're really not poverty at all. In fact, SLI is the real winner for the family on a budget in the Carnival range. It's got all the fruit you really want, that SLI, and it just lacks the frills that you can probably live without. The only properly poverty entrant is the base model Carnival S, and that's really only of interest to dead set stingy stooges among you private purchasers, you know who you are, or fleet managers, and frankly there's a pretty subtle distinction there. I do love those massive sliding doors, and I would not categorise myself as a drive-by enthusiast, typically. Not, you know, nine to five anyway. Access is a real halo feature on this Carnival. In fact, on Carnival Platinum and SLI, you can not only remotely open the tailgate from the key fob and ditto one or both of those drive-by doors, you can access all areas simultaneously by pressing and holding the unlock button on the remote. All three doors open as if by frigging sorcery, like take that, Harry Potter. And if that's not enough, let's say you pull up at the beach one day. All four windows are down, the sliding doors are both open, the tailgate is up and your charges sprint off in the general direction of the dunes. Standing alone in the car park, you look around and you say, Dude, perhaps I might detain myself securing the vehicle then, shall I? Hashtag parenthood. All this otherwise laborious process takes in a carnival is a press and hold of the lock button on the remote. Yes, and all the glass goes up and the side doors and the tailgate all close automatically and then the car locks. I do love that and you will too. This is on platinum and SLI model grades only, like the top two in the range. Pro tip, if this does not work for you out of the box, do not stride into the service department and indignantly demand a refund. It's probably just not enabled yet, and you can do this for yourself. You dive down into the infotainment menu system, you just need to enable it, and you go from memory to settings, vehicle, doors, and then you just tick the box and, hey presto, it's gonna work. Make friends with that menu system would be my advice, because there are lots of personalized preference options buried very deep down there. Plenty of buttons for you to uh, stimulate. I love the auto rear tailgate too, in part, okay, in part. It's great if you are loaded right up with both hands full, you know, groceries and kids, whatever, or in my case, endless friggin' bags of camera gear, whatever. You just walk to the rear and you stand there with the car locked, okay? The car detects the smart key in your pocket or handbag, you get three warning beeps and the tailgate opens automatically and you don't have to free your hands up for any of that crap. That's awesome. On the flip side, I do hate it when the car does this at those times when you really don't want it to, such as when you just stand near the rear end of the vehicle in your garage or carport with your key in your friggin' pocket. I do hate that. And now some love for the enthusiastic breeders among you. Dude, you know who you are. You planned on three kitties, I get that. You did the whole friggin' spreadsheet, like, yeah, honey, we can afford this just. Mostly without eating cat food on most days, kind of thing. And then pregnancy number three turns out to be triplets. <laughs> hey, dude, you loaded the friggin' gun and you took off the safety and you pulled the trigger. Isn't nature wonderful? You get five kitty seat anchor points. You get three in row two and two in row three. And they are all top tether and ISOFIX compatible. And the ISOFIX points in the seat backs don't dig into the back of a normal sized human when he or she is plonking their buttocks there. 
And I do love all of that, it's very convenient. And I love the fact that you can remove the center seat in row two. This allows walk-through access to row three for the grandparents or something because it's undignified for them to have to vault over the seat backs or for you to do all of that decoupling of the seats, the restraints in row two and folding the seats and then putting it all back in place. Like, I mean, who needs that? Every buyer of a seven seat SUV. In other words, they all need to do that, but you don't in a carnival, so go figure. You can just unclip that centre seat in row two and you store it in your very own fat cave indefinitely, dust it off for special events when eight asses present themselves for transportation logistic efforts, seven seats with walkthrough or eight without. Like, take that, Hyundai Palisade. Carnival is, in fact, the shredding as cat of seating capacity superposition when you think about it. With Palisade, however, the waveform on this matter has already collapsed. That's a physics joke. It is pretty heavy, however, that centre seat from row two, and I would not want to sprint uphill and storm a frigging machine gun emplacement carrying that seat, even though it would most probably stop a bullet to save you. So there's that. And... Time for some fairly righteous hatred right now. The row two seats no longer pivot up and rotate forward towards the back of the seats of row one, okay? They did that in the previous generation carnival and that rocked for maximum lengthwise floor space when you transition the vehicle to minivan mode for the all-important run to Bunnings or something. This lack of tipping forward functionality is a consequence of the seat system being re-engineered for club seating configuration, which is where the row two seats can face backwards towards row three. Unfortunately, we don't get to do that here in Australia because it's incompatible with a wiring harness for the seatbelt reminder system for the outboard seats of row two but you can turn the removable centre row two seat around if you want, you know, I don't know, in case Granny wants to stare adoringly into the eyes of her descendants all the friggin' way, cross the nullable, yes. So here in Shitsville, we lost the tilt and the fold forward for those row two seats, and we did not get the full club seating. Damn it. All up, I see that as an unfortunate net deficit for this model in Australia, albeit... Not such a huge problem because I did manage to jam a 1.75 metre tall fridge into the back of the current carnival during the floods and I stuck it right in from the rear too. Yes, very satisfying indeed it was being able to do that in a vehicle such as this. So that was quite uplifting for me but I must say that the top of the fridge was riding up on the folded backs of row two to make it fit. And that fridge was pretty big for a single door jobby. It's about 700 deep and 800 wide, but there was still heaps of space all around it. So the vehicle is still very versatile in minivan mode. Let's get back to the domain of love briefly. I do emphatically love the way the seat belts are built into the seat backs of row two as well. Take that, practically every SUV, with your seat belts inelegantly bolted to the B-pillar where they gum up the works and they get trapped every time you clip row two back in place after folding the friggin' seats. I hate that. They just generally get in the way when you are not using row two as actual bum rests for actual bottoms. So Carnival is kind of brilliant in that respect. One thing Kia does not get nearly enough pats on the back for is the spring-loaded rotary gear selection shifter switch. It feels great, and a lot of unsung work in R&D has gone into making that switch feel good. And all the other switch gear too, feels very premium. This is paradoxically cruel for the diligent dudes devoted to getting shit of this nature spot on, okay? Because switch gear that feels right tends really not to get noticed at all by anyone, except of course other switch gear design engineers, and that hardly counts. Whereas switches that suck, that feel like crap, they stick out like the balls on a big black dog to everyone, metaphorically. The big triumph for this round knurled switch is, however, at the intersection of aesthetics and ergonomics, because it's compact and reasonably elegant, and it's really instinctive to operate. Like, 
you rotate left to get reverse and right to get drive. The park button is in the dead center of the dial and the handbrake switch is kind of just next door. And your left hand just falls on that switch when you drop it off the steering wheel. So there's that. There's no need to take your eyes off the road and you get plenty of proprioceptic feedback going from D to R and back, like haptic feedback. It's dead easy to go from drive to reverse or the other way with your eyes out there on the road at what might be happening around you when you're parking or pulling out from a parking spot. 13 points out of a possible 10 for this execution. Respect where it's due, okay? That is an especially slick piece of design. And this is quite unlike the mark I would give the push-button system Hyundai uses to control exactly the same transmissions. Hyundai's system requires a lot more cognitive bandwidth from the driver, okay? Not to mention a lot more time with your eyes off the road, and it is far less intuitive, which is frankly not ideal, during close quarters manoeuvring situations. This is one area, frankly, where Little Brother is substantially ahead of Big Brother. In fact, I'd rate Kia's rotary transmission switch thingo right up there with BMW's shifter. They're both a departure from convention. They're both very different to each other too, but they are a real step forward once you make friends with that architecture. I love the Carnival's diesel engine too. It provides a wall of low and mid RPM power, which certain bozos who never studied down at the pub might refer to as torque but it's really low RPM power. In any case, this thing makes ordinary driving feel effortless. You get a heap of power at low revs, which is exactly what you want for normal driving. And I would also be quite enamored of the 2.5 litre turbo petrol four, which is absolutely available to Kia for its current vehicles and which would fit beautifully into a carnival and make it perform awesome and be more refined and also more frugal on fuel compared with the V6 petrol engine that Carnival actually offers as an alternative to the diesel. I suppose Kia runs with a comparatively outdated V6 mainly to appease America. They do like their V6s over there on the other coast of the Pacific and one can only sincerely hope that they catch up with the rest of the world soon. Oh well, I do kind of hate the V6 sitting there, seeing as I know how much better the Turbo 4 would have been and how excellent the diesel actually is. If it was my money, dude, I would dig just a little deeper into my wallet and procure the diesel. Purely as a packaging exercise, I do love where they've put the spare tyre amidships, right? In the middle of the wheelbase. If you sit in row two, that spare is right underneath your feet. And should you ever need it, you wind it down from an access cover in the footwell of row two. And having it there frees up a ton of luggage space down the back, even when the vehicle is maxed out on passengers with eight asses planted on all eight seats. Unfortunately, the spare is located on the right side of the vehicle, like the driver's side in our market. Or should I say, the really, really dangerous side, which is exposed to the passing traffic, where you are more at risk of getting cleaned up, ministering to a flat tyre at the roadside. Oops a daisy. It's in the correct location for left-hand drive markets, of course. We just get to be second-class citizens on this, and it's frankly not such a big deal if you think about it. All you need to be is smart enough to drive slowly on that flat tyre until you get to somewhere safe, like an emergency stopping bay or some other location where you can physically separate yourself from the hazard posed by approaching traffic. Unfortunately, though, as we all know, not everyone is quite that smart. But it is a brilliant idea to do that, even if it trashes the flat tyre. Tyres are replaceable, dude, whereas you are not. Adding insult to injury here, the spare is a space saver. This is quite a poor choice in my view. <coughs> Think you'd agree? For a vehicle that's this heavy and seemingly otherwise ideal for long distance regional touring and capable of towing a fairly big two ton trailer. 
If you are towing something heavy, you could, I suppose, get the trailer manufacturer to mount a full-size spare for the carnival on the trailer somewhere, if there's an opportunity for that, because I would not want to drive on a space saver towing something heavy on the freeway in the middle of the night, in the rain, hundreds of k's from home, on a friggin' space saver, which does not grip the road as well as a normal size tyre and is limited to 80 k's an hour, so you'll have the world and its brother rocketing up behind you like 30 kilometres an hour or more closing speed, and I would hate that. It would get old so quickly for me. But then, on the flip side of this issue, you've got to say to yourself, hey, how often do you actually get a flat tyre? So I guess you could just balance that out and find some point of parity that suits your own risk management agenda. Anyway, infotainment OS now, very good, thanks to the huge screen and the decent organisation of the apps and the menus. It's pretty easy to find stuff with that OS. That is on SL, SLI and Platinum, you get a massive 12.3 inch screen, which is a pretty big tablet with split screen functionality, and that allows you to have a simultaneous display of, say, navigation controls and music. Carnival S is a bit poverty, however. You're back to an anorexic 8-inch screen on that one. I do hate the fact that you can connect two smartphones via Bluetooth. What were they thinking? Kia calls this a benefit, of course, but I'm not seeing it. Your phone gets connected so that you can take hands-free calls from... Uh, let's call her... Um, the boss's executive assistant. That could be quite inconvenient with the family on board, on speakerphone, but I suppose you can manage that risk. But the real travesty here, frankly, is allowing her phone to connect contemporaneously while you drive. The better to inflict Celine King Dion upon you all the way from Sydney to Byron Bay. You try sub-vocalising Marilyn Manson or Kid Rock with Celine, King Dion's allegedly greatest hits on volume level 12 after the first six hours on the highway. They make you do that in hell if you misbehave like bad Kia. One final hate, if you don't mind, and even if you do. The imminent forward collision warning system is another massive human factors Failure. Not so much a bespoke failure for the carnival, but an industry failure generally. This is what happens when a bunch of slimy corporate lawyers and ANCAP type agency appeasing middle management weasel wonk bureaucrats push engineering best practices to one side. And I do so hate that. This system just false alarms far too frequently, okay, when there is absolutely no risk of a forward collision. And it is quite strident and intrusive. And typically this happened to me on a twisty, narrow suburban street, okay? You're approaching a gentle right-hand bend and there's a vehicle which is legally parked on the left and everything's fine. You've seen it, you're about to pass it, the issue is handled and there is no risk of crashing. No salient risk, anyway. But you are aimed straight at it because of the geometry and you're doing a nice, gentle, legal 50 and you're paying attention and both hands are on the wheel and you're on it, baby, and the warning system just lights up and suddenly it's friggin' Black Hawk down all over again. Only, engine one has not actually taken a hit from an RPG and you don't suddenly have to auto-rotate into some hot LZ. There's no risk of crashing, like frigging none. So what do you do in this situation inevitably, right? You train yourself over time just to ignore it because mostly it's useless. And this is kind of unfortunate. <laughs> I think you'd agree if it ever does manage to warn you of an actual imminent forward collision threat. And then you respond in this somewhat learned Pavlovian way by just ignoring it again. Kia is not alone here, okay? My Triton does this all the time as well, as do many other vehicles. But the system underpinning these kinds of choices is broken. And this area is fast developing into one of the worst things about many modern cars. 
So there you have it, the encapsulation of my love-hate relationship with the new Carnival. And don't get me wrong here, I recommend this vehicle to you without reservation if you're in the market for a vehicle aimed at those kinds of duties. I tried to hate this vehicle and I failed. It's a really good car, okay? It's just not perfect. And if you go into this spending the big bucks while you are operating under some delusion that this vehicle is going to be perfect and you are finally procuring the perfect car for all of you, you're just paving the road to Heartbreak City. Because no car is perfect. No relationship with a car or otherwise is ever going to be perfect because we live in the real world, not the ideal one. Take, for example, your lovely wife, the mother of your six children. You know what you love about her, right? You embrace that because it's inevitable. But she's not perfect, dude. Except, of course, if she inquires about this head-on or even peripherally, and you know what's good for you, right? Like, honey, does this outfit make my ass look fat? Correct answer. You're so hot, baby. I want you now just like I did the first time I laid eyes on you. <laughs> Does the trick every time. As good as the good bits are, dude, and they are so good, even in a mediocre relationship, the good bits are pretty awesome. I bet she has some quirks. Perhaps she bends your credit card just a little harder than you would otherwise prefer. And she probably has a higher standard of domestic cleanliness than your sort of default ambient setting. She probably does not want to sit there with you and binge watch Sons of Anarchy on the sofa, the complete boxed set, for the seventh time on a Sunday afternoon. Go figure. I don't know why they're like that either. I've never been able to figure it out. She's unlikely to encourage you to come home more often at 2am, reeking of beer and cigarettes, is she? She probably even vocalises her stern criticism of you, something of an unsolicited critique, should you wear the same underpants five days in a row while allegedly working from home. They are quite funny about things of that nature, wives, and I should know because I've had friggin' six of them, and they do hate you when you trade them in on a new model, I must say. Go figure. The point is... Embrace the good, dude. Learn to live with the bad. Otherwise, it's a living hell. Like, Carnival's great, but it's not perfect. Like everything else in life. Except, of course, you and me.